I want to take uh, some time in the weeks to come to go right through this, this book. First Thessalonians, let me just read the first verse to start with. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Just, just stop reading there. Uh, you know, Paul had gone to the town of Thessalonica. Sometimes I get mixed up Thessalonians and Thessalonica and all that. The town is Thessalonica. A person from there is a Thessalonian, all right? And uh, as he was there, he, uh, well, let's, let's take a look in, in Acts chapter 17. Uh, let's get God's description of it here. Acts chapter 17, keep your finger there in, in 1 Thessalonians. <clears throat> Some of these town names are interesting. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and Three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. Evidently it was the practice, and maybe it still is, uh, in the synagogues, if there was a visitor, they would say, have uh, Paul visiting with us today? Do you have anything you'd like to say? <laughs> and uh, Paul, as he was, always had something to say. <laughs> and uh, so for three weeks, now some people think that he was probably in Thessalonica longer than three weeks, but he, he talked to them in the, in the synagogue for three weeks. It could be he was only in Thessalonica three weeks. Uh, but as he, as he preached, some people got saved, and a, and a church was organized. Now, that's who he's writing to when he writes... Uh, the book of First Thessalonians and, and Second Thessalonians. Uh, if you know Paul's history, there were people who followed him around just harassing him. And uh, they stirred people up, and basically they chased him out of town, out of Thessalonica. He went to Berea, preached there. They came, stirred people up, chased him out of town. He, he ended up in Athens. And uh, from Athens, he was concerned, you know, about the, the Christians that had, you know, young Christians in Thessalonica, and he sent back Timotheus and uh, you know, sent him back to, to teach them and help them and see how they were going. And in, in uh, the book of Thessalonians, uh, chapter 3, he says, when, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and uh, fellow, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Uh, that no man should be moved, and so on, in, in these afflictions. Uh, so there was a, a continued relationship uh, with, with those people, even, even if it was from a distance, uh, through other, other men. And uh, when Timothy came back, he brought word that, that they, were, they were doing all right. The Thessalonians had a, had a good testimony. Uh, in chapter 3, uh, verse 6, When Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity... And that you have remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all your, our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Uh, so there was a, a real relationship. Uh, as he had been the one who'd come and, and first preached the gospel to him. And what a blessing that must have been for them and, uh, and for him. You know, as you read about this church, we're not told how big it was. Yeah, it doesn't say, and they had 4,512 on Sunday. It doesn't say, you know. It doesn't say what kind of programs they had. Obviously, they didn't run buses. Uh, probably, probably didn't have a, a, a web ministry, you know. Uh, we, we don't know what all the things they did. We don't know what kind of music they used. Uh, I'm pretty sure they sang some songs, but... Uh, we do know they had a good testimony. And, you know, that's, that's the most important thing. Uh, our, our testimony of living for the Lord and, and our spirit. You know, people, people when they come, when you come to a church, you kind of get an idea of this is a friendly church. This is a not-so-friendly church. This is a, 
you know, there's a, there's a spirit of people. Sometimes I wonder if we're too friendly. <laughs> you, know, you know, people come and boy, we, you know, we, we just love them to death. But uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can be too friendly. But uh, these were people that loved the Lord and had a good testimony. And I want to take some time in, in chapter 1 here uh, to see the, the pattern of what they were like. Uh, read with me. Follow along as I read, starting in verse 2. He says, we give, th we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election, your election of God. Um, they, they had a good testimony. Uh, you can see there, their, their work of faith, their labor of love, their patience of hope. Uh, these were people that, that knew, knew and, and loved the Lord. And I think there's some things in this chapter and with this church that we can see as a good pattern uh, for any church and for us uh, to follow. Now, I've picked out, uh, there's probably more, maybe there's less, I don't know. I've picked out eight things about this church. We probably won't cover them all tonight. But uh, let, let's read on in verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. One of the first things you'll notice about these people, this church, this was a saved church. You say, well, pastor, of course they were saved. You can't be a church if you're not saved. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of churches around where there's not many saved people. <laughs> now, let's be honest. Uh, just because you put the name church on a, on a building doesn't mean it's full of saved people. Uh, and whether you have a building or not, you can have a group of saved people. Uh, church is, is people. Now, these were people, like he says there in verse 1, uh, that they were in God, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, later on in, in verse uh, 5, he says... Um, they're in the Holy Ghost. They have the, the gospel and, and the power of God in the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 17, where we read, you know, Paul preached the word. They heard the word and they received the word. Uh, some believed. Let me, let me read you that, that verse again. Some of them believed and consorted with Paul. You look at that, that word consorted. A lot of times we use that with, uh, you know, in a bad way. But that's a good word. It just means they, they banded together. Uh, they, uh, they identified with Paul and Silas. Uh, and, you know, God, God had called a people, uh, God he had, had called people out of darkness into his light. And uh, there was a difference. These were, these were saved people. You know, in the early days of churches, um, there were things that Satan and people were trying to do to destroy God's work. I mean, we know that. And one of the things that, uh, that people did was they began to teach that baptism saves us or that baptism was a part of salvation. You know, they they might, not, might not teach that it's the only thing, but they'd say, well, if you're not baptized, you're not really saved. And that was one of the, one of the first errors, not, not the first, but one of the first errors that, that came into churches. And, you know, what would happen then is, is people would get baptized and think they were saved and they'd never trusted Christ. Well, the next logical thing that came, and it's very logical, if we're saved by baptism, let's just baptize everybody. Let's baptize the babies. Let's baptize you know, the infirm. Let's baptize the unconscious. Let's, and some even went for baptizing for the dead, you know, that kind of thing you, you read about. And there's still people that do that. Uh, and so you ended up with churches where people weren't saved. You ended up with churches where the leadership wasn't saved. And they weren't really scriptural churches. So when I say this, it's an important thing. A church needs to be made up of saved people. <laughs> uh, 
That's just the way it is. Now, any, anybody's welcome to come, of course. But that's not the church. The church are people who are saved and baptized and organized together to carry out the Lord's work. And it's important. It's an important part of a Christian's life. Now, the Bible says God loves the church and gave himself for it. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an important part of, of our life. Satan wants to destroy that. Now, one of the points that you need to see here is you need to know you're saved. It, it's important for you to know that you have the right relationship with the Lord. God has said he wants you to know. In 1 John, he, he writes, uh, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. It's interesting he puts that belief on both ends of it. And, and the importance of that is that if you're not sure you're saved, you're going to have trouble believing. Uh, we need to know we're saved. We need to understand what salvation is. Uh, God's word is how you know how. You know, it's not by feelings. Uh, it, it's not by some action that we've done. You ask people, are you, are you saved? Now, if they know what you mean, uh, they might give you an answer. And uh, so it's interesting sometimes the answers they'll give. It's not always, yeah, I've, I, I saw I was a sinner and I trusted Christ as my Savior and I was, I was born again. Sometimes it's all kinds of different things. Uh, remember one guy said he was driving his tractor and he got knocked off his tractor and he got saved. <laughs> now maybe there was more involved in it. Maybe I missed some of what he was saying. But I don't think anywhere in the Bible it says if you get knocked off your tractor, you're saved. Now Paul got knocked off his horse, but that wasn't what saved him. Uh, donkey or whatever it was. Uh, you need to know you're saved. And the way you'll know is by God's word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How are we saved? By faith. You know, we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. And faith comes by the word of God. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians there, in chapter 1, verse 5, he talks about how they had much assurance. Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. You know, we often talk about assurance of salvation. Listen, that's going to come from God's Word. There'll be times that you won't feel saved. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is. Our feelings will come and go, and our feelings will fool us. You know, God said, uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Don't go by your heart. Go by God's Word. Uh, faith. Uh, much assurance. And it, when, when you're saved and when a church is saved, others will see. Others will see that you're saved. I mentioned already verse 3. Paul said, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. You know, people will see your work of faith. You know, James said, Without, uh, without works, faith is dead. I'm getting my words backwards. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're not saved by works, but we're saved unto good works. There's going to be a, a work of faith. There's going to be a difference in your life. What you want to do is going to be a little different than before you were saved. And then he talks about the labor of love. Now, if you just looked at that casually, you'd think, well, work, labor, same thing. Well, this is kind of the labor of giving birth. That's, that's a different kind of work. I've never actually experienced that myself. <laughs> but I've been there. <laughs> I've seen, been real close to it. And uh, it's not a job. It's not something you do because you have a contract. Uh, it's a labor of love. You, know, those, you gotta, those words need to go together. And as Christians, uh, we're in this thing because of the love of God. And boy, sometimes it's painful. Uh, one of my daughter-in-laws, man, she was in labor for hours, you know, 40 hours kind of thing. You know, I mean, it, it's tough. And uh, yet, it's because of love. And, and as Christians, we have that work of faith, that, that labor of love. And then he says the, the patience of hope. You know, when, when Paul preached to them in Thessalonica, verse 4, really encouraging. So some believed and they consorted with him. Listen to verse 5. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto themselves certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. There's a good description. Keep that in mind next time you need a description. They took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Man, trouble. Straight away. 
Uh, that's why he talks later on about how they had joy uh, in affliction. They had trouble. But in verse 6, it says, When they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. When you have a saved church, people will notice the change. Now, they may not like it. <laughs> These people, they're trying to change everything. Don't they know that's the way we do it? Uh, you know, we, we need to be people who love the Lord. We need to be people who know that we're saved personally. It's a personal relationship between you and God. And the Bible says it's, it's only in Jesus. And when we gather together as Christians, you know, God can, can use us together. We need that fellowship. Uh, you know, we need to bounce off each other. Uh, God didn't make us to be the Lone Ranger. Uh, there needs to be time when we're wrong to each other. You know what? We need to be able to say, brother, that's, that's just wrong. And we need to take it. We need to correct each other and help rebuke, reprove, exhort with long-suffering long and doctrine. You know, that's, that's what the Lord says. We need that. We need a saved church, people who are committed to each other because they're committed to the Lord. A saved church made up of saved people. You see it in their lives. The second thing I noticed about the church, it was a scriptural church. They were by the, by the word of God. There in verse 5, uh, our gospel came not unto you in word only. Yeah, it wasn't just words, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. They, they were hearing and believing God's word. You know, there, there's people who know and even read the word of God, but they're just, it's just words. It, it has no meaning to them. We don't want to be people like that. Uh, God's Holy Spirit uses his holy word to change us. We do that on an individual basis. We do it corporately. We do it together. We, you know, we study and, and promote God's word because God's word is what will make us what we should be. In, uh, in Hebrews, he said, uh, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. I think it's important when he says, God's word will show us the difference between our soul and our spirit. You see what I'm thinking about? We're body, soul, and spirit. A lot of the times what we do is we let our body and our soul argue it out when we need to be listening to our spirit, the spirit of God. And God's word will, will show us the difference between what soul is and what spirit. <laughs> uh, you know, many times, that, you know, our, we get down in our heart, we talk about. We get depressed. We get, oh man, we got a million words for it, don't we? And instead of listening to our soul and our body, we need to be listening to the Spirit. You know, we, we were reading this morning about Paul giving his testimony. I, I didn't read the verses, but between two of those testimonies, they sound really close together, he had spent two years in prison. He could have, man, he could have been a mess. He could have been depressed and, oh, I just didn't feel like witnessing for the Lord. But man, he was ready. Now, two years in prison. That was house arrest, you know, it, I, I guess. But whatever. This uh, coronavirus. You know, these people are on these uh, what, cruises. And they're moaning and groaning. They've got to spend two weeks on a cruise ship. I think, come on. Count your blessings. Anyway, uh, it wasn't like the Apostle Paul. He was in prison. And after two years, they, they call him out. And he says, let me tell you about the Lord. Yeah, he's ready. He was, because he was, he was scriptural. These were people that in verse 6, it says they, they received the word. Even when it caused trouble. Uh, they followed the Lord. They became followers of us and of the Lord. Listen, the way you follow the Lord is by listening to his word. Uh, they, they modeled the word. Verse 7 says they were in samples. They, they lived the word so that people could not only hear it, but see it. Uh, they sounded out the word, he says in verse 8. From you sounded out the word of the Lord. Uh, this was a scriptural church. The Bible was important to them. There in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, he, he mentions it. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Listen, God's word will work if you just use it. <laughs> 
Believe. Uh, put it into practice. Uh, it'll, make a, it'll make a difference. It'll make a difference to you. It'll make a difference to your family. It'll make a difference to our church, to our community. Uh, this was a church that was saved. This was a church that was scriptural. Thirdly, this was a church that was spirit-filled. Now, I, I think it's just amazing how much of our Christian life we can, we can live and ignore the Holy Spirit. You, you ever thought about it? Yeah, I remember one preacher saying the Holy Spirit could leave the earth and most of us wouldn't even notice, you know. Uh, we need to be people who are listening to the Holy Spirit. And the way we hear from Him is mainly through the Word of God. Uh, in uh, verse 5, he, he talks about how uh, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Do you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake? Uh, they were in the Holy Ghost. In verse 6, it said they were experiencing the fruit of the Spirit, uh, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. You ever looked at the, the fruit of the Spirit? Fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the second one? Joy. <laughs> That's a fruit of the Spirit, folks. Uh, if you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. God's Holy Spirit. He wants you to have joy. Well, these are people who knew joy in affliction. That's real joy. Listen, going to Disneyland, that's not joy, all right? That's fun. Anybody can have fun. But to have joy means you can have it no matter what the circumstance is. Now, these were people that were experiencing the fruit of the Spirit. I mentioned already, a lot of times we ignore the Holy Spirit, and instead of letting the Spirit guide us, our soul guides us. Oh, I don't like that. I, I won't do that. I like that. I'm going to do that. Uh, instead of looking to God for, for guidance. Uh, in Galatians is where the fruit of the Spirit is. And he, he says a lot of things about our relationship to the Spirit. Galatians 5 and verse 5 says, We through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. The Holy Spirit helps us live by faith. In uh, Galatians 5 verse 16 this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Holy Spirit helps us not to live in the flesh. What that means is, when he talks about living in the flesh, is living selfishly. Me, me, me. In verse 18 of Galatians 5, if ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, he guides us. Now, we mentioned already the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22. He gives us his fruit. Every life is going to have some fruit. Some we don't want. <laughs> but we do want the fruit of the Spirit, uh, the product of our life. In verse 25, he says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our life and our walk. And if the Holy Spirit controls us, we won't be walking in the flesh. We won't be selfish. Do, do you realize that most of the grief you experience in life is because of selfishness? You ever think about it? You know, we talk about being selfless. And as Christians, we talk about dying to self and, and so on. But most of the grief in our life is because it's about me. We're selfish. And I'm no different. I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at you. I'm just saying most of our grief is because we, we haven't died to self. And we say, and we sing, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You know, a lot of times that's what we're emphasizing. When God says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now, this was a, a church that was doing their best to be a spirit-filled church. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19, he says, quench not the spirit. That, that's later on, we'll get to. Now, a lot of times when the Holy Spirit's trying to lead us, we're saying, no, I'm not listening to you. My soul is saying this. And the world says, I should follow my heart. Listen, don't listen to the world. Um, this was a spirit-filled church. Fourthly, it was a surrendered church. There in verse 6, so we're seeing it was a saved church, scriptural, spirit-filled, surrendered church. Verse 6, ye became followers of us and of the Lord. I don't know if you've ever, ever thought about it, but being like Jesus is God's goal for us. He tells us that. And that's what they wanted. They wanted to follow Jesus. You know, there's a, there's a certain natural rebellion built into us. We're, we're experiencing that every once in a while uh, in our home right now. 
Uh, we hear these words a lot, me do, me do, <laughs> or why, why? <laughs> Uh, there's just a, a natural rebellion. For those of you who don't know, we have some young children in our home. And uh, let me say this. It, it's not only young children who have natural rebellion. Um, right. you know, as Christians, we need to surrender to the Lord. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, we often quote Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose? Well, then he tells us the purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Because purpose is that we be like Jesus. And God is going to work that out. If you're saved, someday, now you might have to drag us kicking and screaming, but we're going to be like Jesus. <laughs> and uh, we can cooperate or we can not cooperate. Uh, but it'll go a lot better for us when we do. In uh, 1 John chapter 3, he, he mentions it as well. I love this verse. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now, that's not a question. He's making a statement. We are the sons of God. Talking to Christians. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Folks, we're not what we're going to be in heaven. <laughs> All right? Uh, this is not it. <laughs> you know, I, I love Fellowship Baptist Church, but heaven is better than this, folks. Uh, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And God says his goal, he's, his work in us is to make us like Jesus. That's his purpose, and we need to cooperate with that. This was a church that they saw that as the goal. They were trying to cooperate with the Lord. The next verse in 1 John says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Yeah, we, we want to do right. We want God to, to uh, work in us. We want to be like Jesus. You know, sometimes it doesn't hurt sometimes to ask ourselves, well, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus think? How does this affect uh, Jesus in, in all that's happening in, in my life? In uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 and, and verse 12, he makes this statement, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Now, that's the worthy walk. The only worthy walk is one trying to be like Jesus. And as we live our lives, that, that needs uh, to be our goal. Now, it doesn't mean that this was a church that had no problems. Uh, these were not unnatural people. Uh, these were normal, everyday people that God was working in. Uh, they'd been lost people, now they were saved people. Uh, later on in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 3 and verse 11. Uh, this is one of the reasons I know they, they weren't without problems. Ye, we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. A couple of problems going on in the church at Thessalonica. Well, it, that's going to happen. But in general, they were a good example. These were people that loved the Lord. They knew the Lord. They were saved. Uh, they believed God's word was... It, in reality, his word and would, would change them. Uh, they were listening and, and obeying the Holy Spirit. Uh, they were surrendered to God's purpose in their life. You know, the thing I would ask you tonight is this. Are you surrendered to God's will? He says, one of the things he says in Peter is, it's not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, Paul, it was, we read this morning, he talked about all the things that God had said, and, and he said, I was not disobedient. As, as God spoke to him, he said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. No and Lord actually don't go together. <laughs> uh, yes, Lord. And uh, we need to know we're saved. We need to trust Christ, and we need to be surrendered to God's will. Now, some of God's will will be exactly the same for every one of us. There are just some things that God says, this is my will for you. But you know, there's other things that are going to be different. Some of us are men, some of us are women. That's God's will. Uh, some are born in one country, some are born in another country. The only person in this room who had my parents was me. That was God's will. It wasn't God's will for you. And vice versa. You know, there's just things that are going to be different. Well, we need to, some of those are things that we have no, no part in. 
But there's others where we do, where we have to see, well, Lord, what would you have me to do? And, and, and find from God's word. You know, is, is Jesus, is, is he truly Lord of your life? We use that expression a lot. But is he truly Lord of your life? Have you trusted him as Savior? And then are you obedient to him as he leads and guides in your life? Are you even looking to him uh, for guidance? Is there an area of your life where you've said no, Lord? There's a lot of parts of our life, isn't there? Life is not simple. You know, there's the personal things. There's the inward things. Those need to be surrendered to the Lord. Uh, there's family things. Uh, there's, there's community. There's work. Uh, it just it goes on and on, doesn't it? Every area. And I'll guarantee you, if there's an area where you've not given it to the Lord, he'll say, what about that bit? <laughs> because he is the Lord. And he loves you, and he knows the very best for you and for me is that we submit to him. And we won't always understand it. You know, sometimes we'll say, Lord, why? Well, he doesn't always tell us why. But you can count on this. He always has a good purpose. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what God wants in us that we would be like Jesus. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop there this evening. We'll, we'll look at the rest of the chapter uh, next week. But uh, what an example these folks were. Uh, my prayer is that we could be a, a good example uh, as individuals, as a church, uh, that we might be the salt and light that God would, would want us to be. Uh, let me encourage you tonight. Uh, if, if there's an area where you're aware that you're not right with the Lord. Listen, don't be disobedient. Just give it to the Lord. It's better to do it now than to stretch it out and do it later. Uh, give it to the Lord. Give it to the Lord tonight. Let's go to him in prayer. Maybe you need to spend some time uh, before the Lord as I pray. Father, we are so grateful that you love us. Lord, you know our very hearts. You know our souls. And Father, you love us anyway. Father, you see our rebellion you see our difficulties, and, and Lord, you help us. And Father, you offer us salvation. We're so grateful for that. Help us, Father, to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Lord, I pray if there are there, those here tonight who are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would help them to see their need of salvation. Lord, help them to see the difference between their soul and their spirit and to understand that their, their soul needs to be alive in you. And, Father, that only you can give eternal life. Thank you, Father, that you've given us your word, that you gave us your son. You gave us the very best you have. Help us to love you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.